Welcome everyone. What a great morning to be in the company of former professor of literature and writing at City University of New York, Joan Baum. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Lauren Nichols, library director of Amagansett Library and our board of trustees for making this presentation possible. I'm particularly grateful to executive director of the Southampton History Museum, Tom Edmonds for proposing this partnership and to Connor Flanagan and Liana Mizzi for making this collaboration possible. Joan Baum is a critic and reviewer for, among others, NPR, Newsday, the Christian Science Monitor, MIT's Technology Review, Hadassah Magazine, and also writes on the major English romantic poets. A scholar, a champion of the arts, and her fellow creative souls, Joan Baum is a fearless voice for justice in our community, a possessor of quick wit and the equanimity to meet life's challenges head on. Professor Baum, the Zoom room is yours. Thank you so much. I would like to uh, welcome all of you here for a freewheeling talk on the wonderful Wizard of Oz and L. Frank Baum. I'd like to thank Tom Edmonds and Connor Flanagan and Jackie Marks for setting this up. And I wanna thank all of you for tuning in on a day that's been said kind of like the day in The Wizard of Oz. It's an odd topic, The Wizard of Oz, perhaps, given Afghanistan, COVID, Louisiana, but let's see if we can make some kind of connection between the enduring love and success of this book and movie at such a divisive time. My second announcement is that I'm no relation to L. Frank Baum. And for those of you planning to go on Jeopardy, the L stands for Lyman. His dates are 1856 to 1919, and he's from an upstate New York County called Chattanango in Madison County. He had many careers before settling down as a writer of children's books. And these included writing not only many books after the Wizard of Oz, but before he did that, he was a traveling salesman. He sold fireworks. He managed an opera house. He sold china and glassware. He was a storefront window decorator. He was a chicken farmer, fancy chickens, he said. He was a stage actor, a playwright. And in 1881, that's about eight years before he wrote The Wizard of Oz, he went to New York City to study acting. His father gave him money. They were well off. He toured with a rec company as an actor as George Brooks. He loved science and magic and the occult and reincarnation. Some of this is in the book, not much in the movie. In fact, there are episodes called the Dainty China Country in the book, which do not appear in the film. All told, he wrote 55 novels, some of them lost. He wrote 83 stories, over 200 poems, and his wife Maud's mother, who was a big Oz fan, was the famous suffragist Matilda Gage, also a champion of Native Americans. Big irony in this, to which I'll return toward the end. He was also, by the way, which I left out, a newspaper owner for about a year and a half. I usually like to say what prompts the talks I give. And in recent talks on Bugs Bunny and Gulliver's Travels, I was clearly talking about two figures who seemed to be for children, but the books and the cartoons were really for adults. And so I got to thinking, what really is intended for children and really is for children? And I thought of The Wizard of Oz. But of course, you know what I'm gonna say. As I reread it after many years, I saw that there were parts of The Wizard of Oz that were clearly for adults. And clearly adults are the ones who made the book 
and the movie very famous. In fact, today, still in publication, there is a Baum Bugle, the magazine of the Wizard of Oz Club. And it was founded in 1957, went international in 1959. And I'd like to give a shout out for a minute to an article in the Baum Bugle in the winter 1996 issue on Evelyn Copelman, who in 1944 became a famous illustrator of The Wizard of Oz. Her daughter, Susan Bloom, is with us today and perhaps at the end we'll say hi. But as I said, the book and the movie were promoted by adults. In fact, promoted so successfully that perhaps there are few books that have had so many prequels, sequels, all kinds of identities in the theater, in movies, including not too long ago, an erotic graphic novel where an adult Dorothy meets Alice from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Wendy from Peter Pan and they recount their adventures which are seen as allegories of their sexual awakening. But Baum did write the book for kids. Over his writing desk he had a framed saying from 1 Corinthians. When I was a child I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. And he recreated this sense in The Wizard of Oz. In a one page introduction to the book when it came out in April 1900, he writes that it was done, quote, solely to please children. It aspires to be, quote, a modernized fairy tale in which the wonderment and joy are retained and the heartaches and nightmares are left out. Well, some of you remembering the monkey episode in the movie and the book will perhaps disagree. And in the book, there's also a decapitation, not in the movie. Still, what Baum meant is that his book was not like the Brothers Grinch kids going into ovens. And frankly, the wicked witches are not evil. And even the wizard who says he's a good man, though a bad wizard, is likable. Baum wasn't alone, of course, in sending the book out to the world. I hope you can all see this famous cover by the most famous illustrator of all, W. W. William Wallace Denslow, who did the illustrations, and they were done for children. 122 color illustrations and 23 color plates. It was one of the most lavishly illustrated books of its time. Baum and Denslow didn't see eye to eye on characters and incidents. They admired each other, but they negotiated their way through this book. And let it be said, of course, that they had a falling out eventually. Baum went on to write 13 more books in the series without Denslow. But each went on claiming that they alone were responsible for the book's success. Baum's wife, Maud, never liked Denslow's illustrations of Dorothy, by the way. And she wrote that she found her plain in Denslow's illustration and not childlike. Imagine what she would have made of Judy Garland, 16 years old and pretty busty. But the point is that the book was written for children, although children didn't promote it. And in this sense, let me stress that it may be the first such book for American children. When it was written, 1800, Nordic European traditions of fairy tales obtained. The Brothers Grimm, Hans Christian Andersen, and most of all, British authors. In fact, even today, many of you may know this, children's book prizes are named for British authors. The Newbery, 
the Caldecott. But Dorothy wasn't just American, but mid-American and poor. You recall that Alice from Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass was upper class and British. And she was penned by Dodson, who was a mathematician, an intellectual, and in fact, so guarded about his other identity that if anyone wrote to him at Cambridge for Lewis Carroll, he wouldn't answer. So the question remains, if it was written for children, did Baum have a particular child in mind? Certainly uh, Dodson, Lewis Carroll, had a particular child in mind for Alice. And the answer is probably no, though Baum's infant niece of his wife, Maud, was named Dorothy Gage. And in the book, it's Dorothy Gale. Dorothy was a popular name at the time. And Baum had four sons. But here's what's interesting. From what I've read, boys have always identified with Dorothy. She's self-reliant. She's imaginative. She's spunky. She's courageous. She knows how to build a fire. She saves three figures, all male, and destroys two witches. That's pretty good. It's hard to believe, but when the book came out, it was a success, but it wasn't the greater success it was later to achieve. Just the same as when the movie came out in 1939. It was popular, but never so much as after that, and particularly in the 60s with TV. That made the movie. In fact, the book was not always universally welcome. I, that surprised me. In 1959, I read that the director of the Detroit libraries banned it, saying it had no value for children today because it supported negativism. It brought children's minds to a cowardly level. And a school librarian in Washington, D.C. saw it as sentimental fantasy with no moral and said it was poorly written. Now I have to concur, the prose isn't great. And you may wanna challenge how old Dorothy is with some of her locutions, but still the book was a success and Baum knew as soon as he wrote it that he had a winner. In fact, he framed the pencil or the pencil stub with which he wrote it with the inscription with this pencil, I wrote this manuscript of the Emerald City. He didn't immediately call it the wonderful world of Oz. And in fact, other titles were the City of Oz, the Land of Oz. And I gather his wife, Maud, uh, pushed the wonderful Wizard of Oz. The New York Times, when it came out, noted that it was different from other children's books and liked it a lot, as did most of the critics. What the Times meant, I think, is worth keeping in mind. Not only was the book about an American child in an era where the Brits ruled, but it wasn't like Tom Sawyer or Little Women, which looked back in American history. And it wasn't certainly like looking way back to myths and fairy tales romances of the royals, aristocrats. Baum was once asked what he thought of typical children's books, and he said he found them boring. And in fact, The Wizard of Oz has humor. And as I noted earlier, it has an attraction for adults. One, it has puns, and I don't think the kiddies would have picked up on some of them. Don't groan. When Oz fills the scarecrow's head with brains, he fills it with bran and pins and needles. Bran new brains. The scarecrow speaks in a husky voice. The lion gets courage, the name of ale. The woodman who wants a heart replies to the wizard who says, a heart will only make you unhappy. And the woodman says, 
I will bear the unhappiness without a murmur. In a second way, the book, and this is even bigger, attracted adults. Martin Gardner, whom some of you may know, who did the annotated Alice books and who was a mathematician, wrote for years for Scientific American, wrote that The Wizard of Oz is a superb, skillfully written fantasy for children, but children may not be aware of some of the story's satirical thrusts and higher levels of meaning. And he wonders if T.S. Eliot had the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow in mind when he wrote his famous 1925 poem, The Hollow Men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. I don't think so. But what Martin Gardner's statement represents is what happened to the book. It attracted all manner of literary critics who saw in it deep allegorical meaning. If you want to catch up on that, get a hold of the 1999 centennial edition of The Wonderful World of Oz, annotated by Michael Patrick Hearn, and he includes a lot of this information, not believing maybe half of it. In this regard, well, I said this was a freewheeling talk, I want to just take a side uh, trip for a moment that if you are frustrated by people who read allegory into everything, by God, Moby Dick is a whale. Uh, I recommend a wonderful book that caught, called my attention in 1963 by Frederick Cruz. And it was called The Pooh Perplex, a freshman casebook on Winnie the Pooh. It spoofs critics and literary schools and goes into the true meaning of Winnie the Pooh as a Christian allegory, as Freudian analysis, Jungian, Marxist theory, new criticism, post-colonialism. And he did a sequel in 2001 to include feminism and deconstruction. It's erotic and it's also very clever. When the book came out, there were people who saw it, as I said, as an allegory. Some of them wrote articles noting that the scarecrow wears a Russian blouse. The woodman resembles Emperor Wilhelm of Germany, but nothing beat 1961 and the fetish of psychoanalysis and the craze of reading everything in that light so that we have people who are writing essays about the lack of brain, heart, and courage reflecting Baum's castration complex, mother fixation, Emerald City, after all, was Baum's mother's ancestral home, and Emerald was his gemstone. He was born in May. And then we have unresolved, but think about it, because it's not really psychoanalytical, but you may wonder what the answer might be. When Dorothy comes back, Aunt M says, where did you come from? And this is the last line of the book. From the land of Oz, says Dorothy, gravely. Well, that gravely set off another round of critics who wondered, you know, why it wasn't in the movie and what Baum really meant. He could have just said, for the land of Oz. And then there were those who jumped on the yellow brick road. And yet, yellow brick was a very common building material in the late 19th century. And in fact, I read that it was used in the Metropolitan Opera House and the Dakota Hotel in the city. Most of all, however, people jumped on the name Oz. What did that mean? Where did it come from? Although the reigning opinion, including Baum's own, is that he was looking at a filing cabinet one day, A to G, H to N, 
O to Z. And then they started pestering him. Where was Oz? There are maps in the book, but they were certain that he had a particular place in mind. Eventually, Shel Silverstein, who was a children's book humorist, got annoyed because he loved the book and he thought this was really an infringement on Bam's reputation. Why don't they stop? And so he said, you can't visit Oz because there is no land of Oz and there is no tin woodman and there is no Santa Claus. Maybe someday you can go to Detroit. As for Munchkin land, much speculation. It's German, Baum was German. What did he intend to show about the Germans in 1900? I don't know. The book attracted though, not just Martin Gardner, but other adult fans. And one that really surprised me, Gore Vidal, who wrote an extended essay in the very intellectual New York Review of Books, who said the wonderful Wizard of Oz made him develop his imagination and become tolerant and alert to the wonders of life. Another big fan, John Updike, who said he loved the book, he loved the movie, but he loved the book more, and it was very influential on him. In the beginning, I said that uh, the reasons why I was interested in the topic was that, uh, the reason why, was that I was thinking of a book that had been written for children. And what did I know that, that was in March, the next month, there is a special on PBS, a documentary, two hours on L. Frank Baum. I think you can still get it. It was free for a couple of months and it was called The American Oz. And it emphasized the distinctly American nature of the wonderful Wizard of Oz and the sense of confidence, imagination, enterprise, hope for a new and better life that many people held in 1990. Big difference between book and movie, and we may want to talk about this later. In the book, the adventure is said to be real. In the movie, as you recall, it's said to be a dream. L. Frank Baum was fascinated by wizardry. Uh, it was not too long after the Chicago Columbian Exposition that featured among many marvels, the work of the popular wizard of the day, Thomas Edison, the wizard of Menlo Park as he was called. And there were a lot of bogus, fraudulent wizards about that also attracted literary attention, none more so than that given by Mark Twain. Huck Finn, at least the third of the book, is about the Duke and the Dauphin and their phony wizardry and magic. So L. Frank Baum really did have a wonderful interest in showing the contemporaneity of the book and its subjects. In one way then, the book is what I guess all books are to some extent, reflective of their times. And 1900 was a time of great change. You might say that of course about 1939 when the movie came out. One month later, World War II began. And the depression was still not over. But 1900 was a remarkable time. It was the end of the frontier, the end of buffaloes and Indians. The Indians were now on reservations. Sitting Bull was killed a few years before the book came out. The Wild West was no longer wild, at least what we think of as the Wild West in movies. Cities were becoming very popular and people were going west not who were poor or looking for land and survival, but like Baum himself, really enterprising guys who wanted to set up businesses and Baum sure set up a lot, including a newspaper 
in Aberdeen, South Dakota, where he finally landed. It was the age of the auto, telephones, electricity, suffrage, all on the move. Fertile farmland, no longer attractive, but still in the center of the country, unemployment and poverty. So it was an uncertain time. When Baum got to South Dakota, it wasn't even a state, it was still Dakota territory. And shortly after he got there, there was one of the worst droughts in ages. And you see that reflected particularly in the opening, both of the movie and the book, but particularly the book. Auntie M and Uncle Henry live in one room. Dorothy is a little orphan. She lives in Cyclone Alley, as it's called. I counted up in two pages the use of the word gray 10 times. M and Henry never laugh. Toto is her only comfort. Baum drew on South Dakota for this drought stricken, monotonous life. And yet it's home to Dorothy. During the book's episode, she wonders constantly how Auntie M and Henry will worry about her. So she's aware, unusually sensitive, that she wants to get back. And of course, we know from the Odyssey on, that is Homer's, that nostalgia, coming home, a painful but deeply, deeply felt experience may be the most universal quest in all of literature. At one point, Dorothy turns to the scarecrow and says, no matter how dreary and gray our homes, we people of flesh and blood would rather live there than in any other country, be it ever so beautiful. And then that last line, and oh, Aunt M, I'm so glad to be home again. Not the movie's line, which was, there's no place like home. And again, the critics pounced on the word again. I'm so glad to be home again. There are differences, other differences between the book and the movie. A lot of the action in the book, particularly the last half, is either cut out or greatly condensed to move the action along. And a lot happens after the Wicked Witch is dead. Fighting trees, wizards and masks, anticlimactic, which the movie shrewdly cut. There's also, of course, that there were no red slippers in the book. There were silver slippers. And also, the Witch of the North kisses Dorothy on the forehead, leaving a protective, shiny mark. Not in the movie, I think both for dramatic purposes and also for the reasons the slipper color was changed because Silver didn't show up that well in, on the screen. And of course, the big difference, the fact that the movie is a dream, the book is said to be real. At the start, I said, it's ironic that Baum's mother-in-law, the great suffragist, was a great supporter of Indians. And before I go, I want to tell you something about Baum and Indians. And I was pleased that the PBS special included it. As I said, for a brief time, Baum owned a newspaper, the Saturday Pioneer for Aberdeen, South Dakota, where he lived. And as the owner, he wrote editorials. Here is one that he wrote eight years before The Wizard of Oz. It was called why not annihilation? The whites, by law of conquest, by justice of civilization, are masters of the American continent, and the best safety of the frontier settlements will be secured by the total annihilation of the few remaining Indians. Editorials like that ran both before and after the battle, some battle a wounded knee, which took place on December 1890 when the US Cavalry captured large groups of Sioux subculture of Lakota, most unarmed, 300 killed, 
who had surrendered men, women, children. Baum called the Indians untamed and untamable and said it would be better, they would be better off killed than suffering. The PBS documentary, as I said, does include that and attributes Baum's sentiments to the times. And what they didn't say was that Baum was also influenced, his wife was too, by a woman who was a kind of pseudo intellectual but attracted a lot of people, a Madame Blavatsky. I won't go into her philosophy, which was called theosophy, except to say that Yates was also under her influence to some extent. And it was a very important movement of the day, the late 19th century. Madame Blavatsky preached preach a world filled with interracial struggle, superior Aryan race versus semi-human people who included Indians, Blacks, and Jews. Some of you may remember what's been called the most famous mystery ever written, and that was And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. But if you get on Google, and by the way, another uh, title for it is sometimes referred to uh, as the 10 Little Indians. But if you get on Google and you get a copy of the original publication, they weren't called 10 Little Indians. They were called 10 Little Niggers. This was 1939. I don't want to end on a downer like that. It is important to note two things. In 2006, several descendants of Baum, particularly his great great grandson, made a very public and deeply felt apology to the Sioux Nation, and it was accepted because it was so forthcoming. And as far as I can see, perhaps some of you may feel differently, that prejudice does not appear in the book. And here's the great irony. I don't know whether maybe some of you do, the producers or directors know this, but of course, The Wizard of Oz influenced and prompted The Wiz, which in 1975 was directed by Jeffrey Holder. And the film of The Wiz with Diana Ross as Dorothy, directed by Sidney Lumet, Richard Pryor as The Wiz, Lena Horne as Glinda, the good witch, and Michael Jackson as the scarecrow. So it's quite a, an ironic conclusion to a fact of Bound's life that, as I said, is unfortunate. But as far as I can see, the family has been working hard to ensure that that is one, not forgotten, not ignored, but also apologized for. In any case, The Wizard of Oz, the book, was around for almost 40 years before the movie. And then it persevered with what is incredible staying power. Sequels, prequels, takeoffs, ballet, I mean, you name the genre, not one escaped. And so it is a remarkable book written for children, influencing the adult world of the arts in ways probably that no other American book and maybe book in general has done. And I thank you all very much for participating in this talk about it. And I will be delighted to hear from you, your comments, questions that I probably can't answer, but your comments as well. Thank you. Another fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat or in the Q&A function here on Zoom. Um, we got a couple things in there already so we can get started pretty quickly here. Um, first one, I was kind of thinking this as well. Uh, does it ever occur to teachers or parents to read The Wizard of Oz to children rather than attend the movie? I mean, sort, sort of a rhetorical question. question, but. It's a good question. As, as far as I know, I haven't met an adult who has read the book. 
uh, most people have seen the movie, if that, but no one's reading the book. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I'll say I've, I've never read the book. Uh, I've, I've seen the movie maybe once when I was younger, but uh, yeah, it was never, yeah, never really thought about it or taught about it in school or anything. So I never had any understanding of it other than, oh, it's, you know, there's some monkeys that fly around. And... Actually, Connor, <laughs> I wonder if many people who saw the movie even know that there's a book. Um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe The Wiz had some influence in, in schools. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'll say I, I didn't know there was a book. And then when I, I was told we were doing this lecture, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. There's probably a book. That makes mm -hmm. sense. But uh, same person also said, love your earrings. <laughs> um, let's see. So uh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, some more praise. Um, let's see. Uh, here, we have another question. Uh, I've always loved the Wizard of Oz book. But I also loved many of the sequels, especially those that feature Ozma of Oz. Why haven't any of them also become popular or films? It's an excellent question. And there were, as I say, 13 more Oz books in the series. And there have been loads of articles on all of them. They differ. They introduce new characters, new themes, new philosophies. Uh, and the answer may be the one you already suggested, Connor. We can't even get people to know about or read the original. So they kind of have, uh, I haven't checked the shelves. That's a good, good point. Um, when I ordered my own copy, it was of course one that I wanted to have because it had Denslow's original illustrations. So maybe another part of it was that Denslow, who had done a lot of promoting of the original, wasn't in there doing his part for the other sequels. I don't know. Yeah, Good. interesting. I, I had no idea that there were also more stories to be told. Uh, I didn't know that there was 13 more books. So yeah, that's just, I mean, definitely future reading for myself to look into and see mm -hmm. what, what all has to be told. It's very interesting. Yeah, I just thought of something. I, I will check just out of curiosity now. I will go to the children's room of the East Hampton Library and see if they have a copy of The Wizard of Oz. And if they do, I would suspect that like Gulliver's Travels, it's abridged, even rewritten for very young children. I'd be curious, by the way, in that regard, yeah. how old people think Dorothy was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, somebody else asking, uh, do you think uh, children of today would react differently to the book if they were to read it versus maybe children of years past? I do think that if children were given a copy of the book, they would enjoy it is like science fiction, a fantasy, but, and it has enough fear so that it's not, as critics have pointed out, any kind of sentimental tale. Uh, and I think it would engage them. It's yeah, it, too bad that the adults who don't know about it don't introduce it. And including in the adults, we include the teachers. Yeah, it almost sounds very Lord of the Rings-esque. Uh, where it's very fan high fantasy, and, and I think I think teenagers and stuff today would probably enjoy it the same amount. And then especially all the allegories and stuff like that you mentioned, and like all the mm -hmm. different things. If if anyone's a history buff, you know, there's a lot to get into there. Learning about early America and you know what all these characters really represented, rather than just being a scarecrow to be a scarecrow. Right, right. But um. Let's see. There's mostly everyone here is just saying you did, that they loved your talk. Not too many questions. A lot of uh, praise on the earrings and the uh, and the talk itself. Um, does anybody else have any questions per se? Um, if not, I mean, I'll just echo again what everyone else has been saying. This was a really fantastic talk again, uh, highlighting different ideas and stories about this book that. I wasn't aware of, and I'm sure many here today were not aware of. Well, let me, let me just reiterate uh, the fact that 
the PBS special, uh, which is two hours from channel 13, uh, can be seen. It's still around. It's not free anymore, but I think, you know, minimal charge. And I think people would find that fascinating because it's really an invocation of the time and the setting in which Baum moved. He was an incredibly talented guy. And for those who aspire to be children's writers <laughs> of children's fiction, I think it's a wonderful model. And the fact that he didn't even start until he was 40, which is unusual, uh, is incredible. Yeah, I'll definitely, what I'm gonna do is after this, I'm gonna look into finding a link for that PBS special. And when we post this on YouTube, I'll, oh, that that, be great. That I'll include be it in the description. So anyone who watched uh -huh. it so far, if you made it to the end, you'll now know. You can click the link in the bottom and hopefully watch the um, the special and learn even more about Bomb. Um, so again, I want to thank you, Joan, for providing us with this talk today. And Jackie from Amagans Library, I want to thank you for helping to co-sponsor today's event. Um, and I, I, I think we, uh, I think it was great. Thank you all again. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Have a great day. You can be ever with a Because, 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 because